Hello and welcome to this Hornets Heroes YouTube series, episode five, and I'm delighted to be joined by Nathan Ellington. Nathan, uh, happy new year. Thank you for joining us and in, in such difficult times as well. How are you? How are your family? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. I'm good, obviously. New Year's, obviously, same old things happening from last year. So we just got to put up with it and just get on with things. And, um, you know, hopefully things will get better soon. So hope you're doing well as well, to be fair, and you and your family. So Thank you, Rupert. Um, so first off, you played 56 times for Watford. And I know it wasn't always plain sailing and you had your moments at Vicarage Road. Uh, but when you reflect on your time with the Hornets... How do you reflect on it? I mean, what, what do you think of when, when you first think back to your time at Watford? Um, it's kind of mixed, really, because um, obviously I didn't have the best of times playing. I um, probably had uh, the hardest time with the type of football I played. But then there was a, a period when I played under Malcolm Mackay, and that was a great time. You know, although I could only play off the bench because of the way they bought me and add-ons, which they couldn't allow to happen. So... Basically, that was a really good time. I really enjoyed myself when I was playing at that point in time as well. So it's just a bit of a mixed bag, really. Um, when I started, when I came to the club, obviously I was told I was going to play. <laughs> um, you know, and um, Gaffer seemed really chuffed that he brought me in. And um, when we got, when I got in, it wasn't his fault either. The boys were doing really well. They won the first games. Um, I came in. I was on the bench and then we just won every game at the beginning, didn't we? So it was like 10 games on the trot, it was 10 wins and, 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 and that was it. So for me sitting on the bench, I was sitting there thinking, damn, I'm a, I, you know, I wanted to leave West Brom to play games and um, go back to up the Premiership. And um, I'm now moved on and I'm on the bench. <laughs> so, And we didn't have many um, reserve games either. So it was, a, it was a tough one because I knew I couldn't say anything because the boys were doing well. And... Um, like I said, no game. So I wasn't, I didn't have that match fitness when I knew I was going to come in for a 90 minute spell one day. I knew it was going to be quite hard. Um, but um, obviously, I tried to stay as fit as possible. And, um, and then obviously, when it did come to the time to get involved, I think Gaffer, some, for some reason, wanted to go a lot more route one than usual, um, should I say. And um, it, it made it very difficult for myself, um, who was not used to playing that. Uh, you know that direct and um, it obviously played a part in obviously us kind of dropping off from the top of the table and um, quite a few of us obviously not playing to our potential really so I was just going to say Malky Mackay was so different to Eddie Boothroyd in playing style and what was it hard was it hard to adapt to Boothroyd's style of football very hard because um, you know when I first came in I thought we was um, going to like pop it around quite a bit because you look the, look at the players we had they were capable of doing that and um, when I came on the pitch in the first game I think um, I was so buzzing to get on the field I think I even hit the post within five minutes and um, basically I was like really like a live wire like moving between the lines asking for the ball from the midfield and then after the game I think Joby McEnough said to me listen we're, we're not allowed to do that here I was like do what? what pass the ball <laughs> pass the ball through the lines is that Nah, you don't want us doing that. I'm like, yeah, really. Yeah, I thought he was just having a laugh. Mm. But um, as as time passed and we obviously got into training and stuff, I realised that it is actually true. Because um, when we did have a meeting, um, we did have the the manager, uh, Boothroyd. He actually mentioned one point. I remember specifically the words coming out of his mouth. He said, "Look, you know, if you do try and play it through the lines, no problem. It's got to get there though. Because if it doesn't, you'll be sitting with me." And I was like, "Wow." So you, you take players off for trying to, you know, be imaginative and stuff. And that's what I was used to. I came from West Brom, so they played some really good stuff. So it's a bit like a um, bit of a killer, really, because, um, it, again, it's going to only reflect on my own, um, appear, uh, my own uh, like, ability on the pitch. And then for the first time, I, I, I get a bunch of play, um, supporters obviously not going to be happy with me because I'm not playing to what they expected of me. So. It hurt a lot. It did hurt a lot. But um, again, it's it because the AD Boothroyd got a lot of success at the beginning of the season, playing pretty much that way. He felt that that was the best way, and I don't blame him for that either. I'm not saying he's a bad manager because of it. He just felt like he couldn't do that with the players he had at the time, or he maybe didn't have the time to implement that. So it, then it could take effect quick enough for us to go on. 
But he did end up, um, <laughs> you know, saying we can now play football when we got to the playoffs. And I was like, man, last minute dot com, you know, <laughs> better late than never. But it's a bit late now. We, we can't, you know, we're just going to get to grips with playing together. We had two training sessions and we had um, Hull City next, who are used to playing their way they're playing. And I'm sure if we did that from halfway in the season, we would have been blitzing it and we would have, you know, definitely done a lot better than we did. That's it must sure. have been difficult kind of mentally as a forward, not being able to, to play the way you want, the way you're used to. Do, do you think that had, a, had an effect on, on your time at Watford, the kind of the mental side of it, that you, you weren't so happy there? Yeah, I, you know, I'm not one to complain about how, people, how, do, how we play football. You know, every team plays a little bit different, but this was like, I can't say, I, I felt like we were playing for Danny Shitu to score goals and to defend and to win corners and to do everything. The ball went into the opposition's half. Even if it was by the halfway line, we got Lee Bromby on it to throw it into the box, into Danny Shitu to head it for us to score. And I'm not used to being able to score off a flick on. For, and that's my only chances in a game. So it was very, very difficult. Um, all we did, used to do then is say, look, come on, Danny, get us a goal. That's all we, everyone would say, come on, Dan. And he's a defender. So imagine how much work he had to do because he was that good at winning headers and being so powerful. The gaffer went to him a bit too much. And, um, <laughs> you know, it kind of it hurt a lot of the other strikers that we had. And we had players who could get a lot of goals. And um, even Steve Cabot didn't really play at all. And he had, um, you know, good uh, goals ratios at his clubs where he's been at before as well. So, you know, it was a bit of a, it was, I guess we didn't use our players well enough. That's what I would say. We definitely didn't use our players to their potential. I think we even played less than half our potential really? that season. I mean, I mean, it's so, so interesting to hear that. And football back then, even 10, 10, 15 years ago, so different to how it is now. Uh, you were 3.25 million when you signed for Watford, which was the club's record signing at the time. How did yeah. that have an effect on you? And when a player joins a club as a record signing, what effect does it have on them? You know what? I had no thought of it in my mind at any time. At any time of my move did I think of that. Because I don't get it. I don't get the money. I don't get paid it. Really? So, end of the day, it doesn't mean anything to me. I'm just there moving. So, when I, it only dawned on me when a player came in and overtook that, um, that record. It was years later, and then they mentioned me. I was like, oh, I got mentioned. I got mentioned in Watford. And then it was like, oh. Finally, someone's obviously come in for a more a better fee than Nathan Ellington, who they always remember as a player who didn't do much at the club. So it was, um, yeah, it was just that was all it was for me. I'm telling you now, when it comes to um, rec uh, you know, signings, the club and the club they make an, a deal together, and that's it. They do what they didn't. I remember, I already went for three million um, to Wigan any to West Brom anyway from Wigan. So to go for 3.25, it meant nothing really to me. Um, it was just to the clubs that, um, that it meant something, to be fair. So I didn't even have a think about it one bit. So your job was just to play football. And that was exactly. Crazy. Come yeah. in, score goals, play like, I used to, like I've always played, you know, 25 goals plus a season. And obviously, we, we couldn't get that because of the, I, I believe, you know, obviously everyone has their beliefs and understanding of how things went. Mm. For me, I could see why. Um, but like I said, I shot myself in the foot a bit uh, during the season a little bit because although it's not my way of playing um, and it does get into your mind, it does play on your performance level and your work rate and everything to do with everything. So I'm not saying I purposely kind of didn't do anything, uh, didn't work as hard. But what, after I had a chat with one of the guys, um, I would sit in a room with him and he would ask me, why do you think you're not playing? You know, it was a counsellor kind of guy. And he was saying, OK, do you, what do you, it'd, it'd get me to tell him my own answers to why I'm not playing and what I should, what do you think I need to be doing to be playing? And you start thinking a bit differently. And then I played really well on another game. The, the, the next game, I played really, really well. Worked so hard. And I scored in the game yeah. as well. Worked real hard. And after that, that game, I remember that he said... Um, uh, I've seen a change in somebody. Didn't want to mention who it was, but obviously he knew it was like a change in mentality in, in the way you're kind of looking at the games going forward. Instead of moaning about this and that, just, just 
work, work, work. Don't care what's going on. Just, you know, it's kind of like that's the kind of mentality you have to have because you're never going to get everything your way. And again, like I said, some, some of it's my fault and some of it's the fault of knowing the players who you want to bring in to play the way you, the way you want to play. You know what I mean? So there's players all over the place in different teams like Torres, for example, from Liverpool to Chelsea. People wondering why he's not doing the same. It's because he doesn't have Gerrard behind him in the same type of counter-attack football. Uh, you know, and if, you know, it's, it's, it's all about players that they're going to be around and the football they're going to be playing, which will bring out the best in them. Well, I've always said that it doesn't matter who they are. A footballer is a human being. They might be earning lots of money, but they're a person and uh, that matters. And with the fans at Watford, I understand it was difficult. Obviously, it wasn't the easiest, easiest time in your career. What was it like with the Watford fans? To be honest, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. I knew there was a, you know, probably a few people that were upset but more, and more often than not, I would come across the people who felt the same way as me. Why did he bring you in if he's going to play like that? And I know you're not, you know, the reason why you're not doing as well is because of this. And they would say it to me. So uh, they know, kind of, they know football. Those who know, knew the football understood, like, okay, he's not having the best of time here because it's not like he's not trying or he's not this, he's not fit, he's not that. I was trying, you know, I was doing whatever I could. To, to you know to get to where I need to be but things didn't work out how they should have and um, I'm sure if we both had our time again I'm sure if he brought me in at the start of that season I'm sure he would have not played that way um, that late he would have tried to start playing from a lot earlier um, with the boys we had we had so many good players on the pitch there I was just puzzled as we couldn't why we couldn't play with the boys we had I was just like dreaming about playing good football with the boys. Like it's so many good players, but like I said, um, it didn't happen, did it? And um, it didn't work out in the end. Well, well, look, it didn't. But you've played for so many clubs and have so many memories elsewhere. And football's a massive part of your life, as is Islam and being a Muslim. And uh, did the transition start at Watford to, to becoming a Muslim? And how difficult kind of was it to balance football and religion? Um, no, no, to be fair, it was uh, my last year at Wigan. Um, okay. uh, it's the January of that year that we got promoted, actually. But I understood, uh, I, I was researching about religion and stuff, and I came to, obviously, to I had enough knowledge there that I felt like, look, this is what I believe to be, you know, the truth of, of why we're here on this on this earth. So, for me, I just, you know, took it on board, and I was really excited. Uh, but it didn't take anything away from my football. There was nothing to do with balance or anything like that. Because when I first understood it, I didn't know about all the rules and everything you have to do. I just carried on my life like normal, but just called myself a Muslim. That was all. Yeah. So at the time, there was no change in my life. Um, but the only time when I did really change is I grew my beard a little bit. Um, and I was started eating different, you know, halal meat, which is the same pretty much. But it just obviously killed by a, 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 either a Christian or a Jew or Muslim. Not a problem. Um, so I can only eat from, you know, people, what we say, people of the book, people of the, the previous scriptures or our own scripture. So that's fine. Um, and then, uh, to be fair, it was, it was just like getting to grips with praying, but that's nothing to do with the football side of things. So they were totally separate, really. There was nothing really um, that really was getting in the way of my football. But I found that because Islam was kind of seen in a bad light through the few things that were happening around the time. And I was oblivious to it at the time because I didn't realise that that was like connected to Muslims. But um, it's the religion, it's Islam, it's not Muslims. Islam and Muslims, there's two different things. It's Muslims are people who are trying to adhere to Islam and then Islam is Islam there. So I understood Islam for what it was and that's why I was trying to, to follow that as best as I could. But um, people in the world, obviously, they'll see it as a negative. Um, so for me, who was out there with it kind of thing, not what thinking, like, you know, this is going to have a negative effect. It kind of did at times as well, because people would say, he's not interested in his football no more. And I was thinking, why are people saying that for? Like, why? Because I want to read a book on the bus or something. Uh, you know, what's wrong with that? Instead of playing cards and betting for money, why can't I sit on the, on the bus and read a book? Like, what does that mean? I'm not interested in football no more. So it didn't make no sense. I still play computer games all day, every day, still watch movies, still do all the same old things I would do anyway. So 
there was no change apart from my beard got a bit longer. That was all, you know. It didn't, and, um, it didn't even affect your football. That's it. No, but they yeah. did. A lot of people did say, and I did end up getting some kind of, I guess, uh, something attached to me as some people would make mm. a comment that I'm not interested in the football as much anymore. And obviously, as you see, it coincided with me being on the bench a lot and then not doing so well. So obviously, they're trying to put the two together, and then it's like, oh, he's, he's not interested in football. He's not the same guy anymore. And there's me. You know, feeling like I'm, you know, feeling great, really, you know, wanting to go and play. And it's just difficult when you don't play and managers then start saying he's not played for this amount of time. What's he done? And that's where the struggle happens. I'd love to think the game has changed now, moved on a bit with the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, and taking the knee in football. And uh, do, do you think we have made progress in that department? Do you think now football is more understanding and more inclusive? Yeah, there is, yeah. But there's still going to be that, that bunch of people, you know, here and there um, that are obviously going to be quite negative when it comes to that stuff. I don't get that. I don't understand it, to be honest. I, I see people as people, no matter what colour they are. I've never, ever thought like that. I don't know how people can think like that, if you get what I mean. We're all That's humans. It. We all bleed the same. We all breathe the same. We're all the same. We're just from different parts of the world with different tones in your skin. So, um, end of the day, some people are ignorant and, you know, you're never going to change some of them. But most people, as long as we keep on top of it, I think the majority will obviously be able to stamp out most of it. But it will never fully go. Um, no. Like I say, it's best to have initiatives anyway, so we can at least um, continue to make it reduced. Completely agree with, with what you're saying. It doesn't matter, uh, skin, background, religion, whatever it is, everyone uh, is the same. And of course, back to Watford, they're under... Uh, manager Chisco Numunez now, the, the new boss in charge of the Hornets. What's your view been on Watford this season, looking in on uh, a, a massive transition period at the club and the revolving doors continued? How, how do you look at it from kind of a pundit's point of view? Uh, to be honest, I haven't uh, followed as much this year. Uh, I have been watching, um, um, what's his name? On uh, He used to play up, he was up front for you guys last year and he's on. Te he's always on the uh, radio now. Um, Troy Deeney what's the striker's name now D D Troy Deeney that's it Deeney. yeah so I, I listen to him all the time and that always obviously reminds me of Watford um, so I obviously knew about a few of the boys that are down there um, Mariapa's just moved hasn't he so um, I used to obviously yeah. he was one of my good friends while I was there he's been there for so many years now he's at Bristol City um, so I'm not see I don't know anyone at the club anymore so it's not the same as like when I go and I turn the channel on and I, and I look at the club I don't know anyone anymore, so it's, uh, it's a bit weird. But um, that's why I've... Pardon? Ben Foster? Do you, do you in contact with him, Ben? No. No, he wasn't there when I was there. He wasn't there when you were there, OK. I no, wasn't there with him. OK, so li yeah. literally all, all of your generation has gone elsewhere now. Everyone but, Mal uh, but um, obviously Mariapa until he left. He was the only one left at the time. So for me, I haven't followed um, a lot of what they're doing at the moment to be honest. Um, so I do obviously look out and whenever I see, I look for the teams and the names and see if they've won or something. But apart from that, I don't really um, look into all of the players and what they're doing, to be honest. So I obviously wish them the best all the time, um, no matter what, because I played there and I always obviously, when I watch the games even, I look at where I was coming out of a tunnel, which is a different tunnel now. And, you know, the stadium has been upgraded a lot better now and stuff like that. So Obviously, I watch and, and, and see little bits and pieces. But um, I'm like a Man United fan since I was, you know, five years old. So, for me, I've got back to being a Man United fan kind of thing and watching them every week. And, well, and that's uh, me what, kind of so thing. Manchester United versus Watford on the weekend. So, I take it you want Manchester United to win then. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I mean. I've always supported United. And, you know, I've always, even when I played against them, I wanted to win. But I wanted them to win the league because I knew we weren't going to win the league. I was yeah. thinking, OK, I want them to win the league. But when we play them, I want to score and I want to beat them. You know, but um, that was the only time I want United to not win. <laughs> so, um, even you know, it doesn't matter who they play, apart from if I'm playing in the team, to be fair. So, well, Nathan, look, you're a star. Diehard you. supporter, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule. And um, we really appreciate it. Stay safe, stay well and uh, have a great New Year. Thank you.